Okay. Great. All right, welcome to the last session, session five. This is going to be on a, a one of my um, pet project, pet topics, um, metabolic control analysis. Um, this is something I did during my PhD a long time ago, and I've been doing it on and off ever since. Um, there's a bunch of slides here, but the main one is this one, MCA one. And I've got some, I've got some exercises for you to do as well. We can do them together. Um, so let's start this slide. So some of you may have heard of this, some of you may not. Um, let me first say, you know, what what do we use it for? What's it for? So, well, as a when I was a PhD student, one of the things that really bugged me was um, looking at a pathway like this, right? Um, which again is the I think it's the Jenna Wolf one, uh, and noting that it you know it could oscillate. The question was, why does it oscillate? how can I understand what's going on in this network? I mean, I would do things like this, right? And I would think, yep, I have no idea what's going on. Um, that was the big problem. So, you know, you can do simulations, you know, lots of different kinds of simulations. And if the model is, you know, complicated like this, or lots of moving parts, you probably have no idea what's actually going on. And, you know, some people, you know, don't, you know, some people are not too concerned about understanding what's going on, but if you're one of those people who just needs to know what's going on, then this can become very frustrating that uh, you that need. No, you're back. A, what's that? Your sound cut out for a second again, oh, but, uh, it's, and then it came back, yeah. Oh, it's okay. Let me just, yeah, it should be all right here. Uh, let me just make sure the connection's okay. Um, so these are the kinds of, and there are a lot of questions you can ask of MC, but these are the kinds of things you can ask. Um, maybe I should give you the what what started it all. Uh, this is back in the nineteen uh, late sixties. Uh, somebody was doing an experiment where they eliminated ninety five percent of the enzyme activity of an amino acid by synthesis enzyme in uh, Aspergillus, the fungus Aspergillus. And they noticed that the Aspergillus looked exactly the same as it was before the, 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 the loss. It was almost a complete knockout, right? The, this organism had lost 95% of a specific enzyme, and yet it appeared to be quite well and had no problems at all. And so it struck them, was how can you lose 95% activity and still remain you know, alive? Um, and so this started their studies into, okay, you know, to understand this, we need to understand networks, we need to understand, you know, biochemical networks, and this is what it all started. And this is where the whole field then emerged from. So the kinds of questions then, and this became, you know, quite a big area in the end, and the kind of questions you can ask, you know, quantify how different components of a pathway influence the concentrations and the fluxes, okay? Um, and not only does it quantify, deep enough it'll tell you why mm. some components are more have more influence than other components the other thing quantify the degree to which perturbations move through a system i mean i think of a pathway more as a you know communication network where you 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 do something at one end and the whole you know that disturbance travels right through the network uh, as a wave um sort of as a perturbation so you can quantify you know, how perturbations move through the system. And the other thing, of course, you can do specific questions like understanding how feedback control affects pathway behavior. There are a lot of basic questions you can address, but then if you're an applied person, you may be thinking, you know, what what is in it for me? Well, there are obvious things you can do. One is I want to improve the production of something in a metabolic pathway. Which enzyme should I be, you know, engineering? Right, that's that's a really fundamental question for a metabolic engineer. The other one, if you're a, more of a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to develop a new drug, I mean, the first question you should ask perhaps is, tell me what's what's the best target. I don't have the drug yet, but I need to know a good target to which I can then develop the drug for. That doesn't tend that happens to some extent today. Um, but not as much as it could. And so MCA will let you identify suitable targets, which you can then design a drug for to apply to. Okay, so those are the sort of basic questions you can answer. And, you know, a little bit of the origins. It's funny, you know, three groups pretty much came up with this independently in Edinburgh, Berlin, and Michigan. 
uh, almost identical theory uh, on the analysis of perturbations. And so if you look at the literature, it's got various names, at least in the past, but MCA is sort of what it's called now. But you may come across uh, BST, biochemical system theory. Um, and in fact, uh, if you look, where did, where did I put it? Uh, oh, here. This book here, uh, it's from 1976, 1974. I'll put it in, the, in, the, in my thing there. This is um, Michael Savage. So Michael Savage was also one of the originators of this field. And this is his book. It, this is an I don't know if you can hear me, Herbert, but you're yeah. Oh, there you are again. You you just talk, started talking about the book and then you cut out and now you're back. I really it's, um it's is anybody else is it just your thing? Is anybody else hearing me cut out? Yeah, yeah. You're you're uh -huh. cutting. Yes. I am cutting out, am I? Huh. Uh, let me just disconnect the speaker and reconnect it, okay? Okay, I've reconnected now. Uh, I don't know if that's gonna be any better. Um, anyway, this is an old classic book um, from Michael Michael Savage in Michigan. So anyway, okay, so let's let's start on this. So here's maybe You're off again. So oh, off again. Oh, I wonder if it's because there's no one else saying anything. It's like it, like as soon as I say something, then it comes back. Oh, no. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I That's don't obnoxious, know. but anyway. Oh, uh, God, let me know if it happens again. Okay. Um, Maybe just okay. as long as I say something, every time it happens, it'll like <laughs> reboot. It'll come back. Okay. Here's a metabolic map, anyway. And in here, there's an enzyme, phosphofructokinase. I want to change it. I ch I upregulate the expression of this enzyme. My question is, how does it affect the glycolytic flux, and how does it, you know, affect the metabolite levels in the Krebs cycle? A very basic question. That's, uh, you know, even today is hard to answer. Surprisingly, other than doing, you know, literally the experiment. So, but that's the kind of question that MCA can answer. Right? If I make a perturbation here. How much will it affect everything else downstream or upstream and so on? Okay, so I'm going to lay out a bunch of principles here. Um, so the first principle is this. Um, this will become clear as we go on, but it cut again. Uh, oh, an example that might make You're more sense, again. but you take, yeah, right, I'm back again. You take a car <laughs> engine, right? Those of you who know about car engines, probably, you know, you know about the carburetor that controls the fuel going into the engine. If I were to take the carburetor out and just look at it on its own, it might not tell me much about what the carburetor is doing. And I have to look at it in the engine operating in order to get an idea what it's actually doing and how it relates to everything else in the engine. And so the same applies to um, enzymes. I can't look at one enzyme and say, yeah, this is what it does because the enzyme is sitting in a mm -hmm. sea of enzymes and its behavior is modulated and so on. So it's very hard to, I mean, my supervisor once said, the only way to study a system is to study the system. I mean, it's an <laughs> obvious statement. Bas basically say, you can't just look at the parts and hope to understand everything. You also have to look at it in the context of the system it's in. So that's the first principle. The other one is this. Um, I just put this in just for the hell of it. Um, I mean, a living cell is a molecular democracy. Uh, it's got a distributed decision-making apparatus. Now, the reason I say this is because a lot of people yeah. like to think of a cell like a computer. It's not like a computer at all. Uh, a computer has a clock, and it has a set, set number of instructions that dictate its behavior. It's very linear, very sequential. Um, a living cell is not like that at all. It's decision making is distributed everywhere. Okay, so it's very different. So somebody coined the phrase uh, "molecular democracy" for the living cell, you know, rather than a dictatorship. Uh, yeah, okay. A living cell does not operate like a digital computer with a program and sequential operation. It's easier to think of it 
like that because you know computers are all around us and then we try to make the analogy between what we have in our everyday life with what we see in nature it doesn't always work i mean the victorians thought of everything in terms of steam engines uh and so on so okay so let's um let's do some studies then shall we so here we are here i have a pathway it's got six steps five metabolites this step at the beginning x zero indicate this is fixed okay? okay so um what i'm going to do is i'm going to run a simulation of this and then we're going to do a perturbation uh of this step okay this graph okay all right so i okay. i ran uh, this simulation and i actually put together a little fun thing um i you can do this with tellurium and with a couple other packages in python you can actually run an animation you can run a simulation and animate so oh, okay. what i've got here are two videos i made of a simulation what you'll see are bar graphs coming up and down as the model evolves the first one on the left all the steps are irreversible the one on the right all the steps are reversible and you will find that there's a fundamental difference in the behavior of these two cases so let me just run this one so it's first approaching steady state okay and then at time 75 i'm going to uh, increase e3 there it goes okay yeah. unfortunately it then it then um yeah. goes back to the beginning which is a nuisance so let me take it <laughs> can i uh now hit 75 and it'll do its thing there it goes i'll stop it Ugh. okay there okay um there are there are there are differences you can see but there's actually a very very significant difference and what i've done is i've pulled these out and i've and i'll in in the static form and i'll show you oops hold on it wants to keep running well i'll show you so these are the snapshots i took um for this system so the left hand side is now reversible i don't know why i swapped them the right hand side is irreversible you see the shadow of the blue, blue shadows in the background those are actually they mark the steady state points of this pathway mm -hmm. before the perturbation okay they mark the steady state points so um so the top the top row shows you up to the change before the perturbation and you can see in both cases the bars reach the steady state all right the bottom two show what happens after the new steady state has reached after I've perturbed E3. And what I don't know if you'd noticed this, but for the irreversible case, the steady state levels of S1, S3, S4, and S5 are exactly the same as before the perturbation. Yeah. Whereas the steady state levels of the S1, S3, S4, and S5 in the reversible case are actually different. Now, what do you think is happening here? Why do you think that the um, S1, S3, and S4 are totally unchanged? S5 are unchanged in the in the irreversible case, but S2 isn't. There's something very fundamentally different here about how propagations are moving through this pathway. Anybody got any ideas? your uh e3 is the level of enzymes so the both the forward and the reverse reaction yes. are affected when on yeah in, in the step. reversal okay. case yeah it just goes faster yeah both both uh, both directions back. go faster yeah. yeah it just makes everything faster in the number three yeah well let me give you a clue um so let's say I increase E3, okay? So if I increase E3, the rate from S2 to S3 will increase, right? I think we all look more enzyme, higher rate, okay? If that happens, of course, I'll consume S3 faster 
sorry, S2 faster. Therefore, S2 will start to get consumed faster and start to drop. And that's what we're seeing in both cases here, S2 drops. That's because it's getting used up more. Now in the reversible case, because E2 is reversible, when S2 drops, this step gets faster because there's less product inhibition from S2. So if this gets faster as well, S1 drops. And so here you see S1 dropping. The other ones, if S2, so if S1 drops, and I haven't changed anything else here, and that means that the steady state rate, the flux with the pathway must also drop. I've not plotted that here, but I should have actually, because that's the big clue. In the reversible case, the net flux with the pathway will actually, will actually change. Actually, the flux will increase. Sorry, I made the mistake. It actually increases. The flux, the net flux with the pathway will increase. If we go to the irreversible case, and I now increase E3 here, S2 will drop, definitely. But because E2 is irreversible, it has no effect on this reaction rate. E1 and E2 live as if E3 doesn't exist. Uh, so mm -hmm. they will be doing exactly the same thing as they did before, which is why uh, S1 remains unchanged. Since S1 is unchanged, E1 was unchanged, the flux through here, through X0 to S1 is unchanged. And that steady state, all the fluxes have to be the same. So if this flux is unchanged, this has to be the same, the same, the same, the same, the same, all the way down to E3. And since the rate through E3 is the same as what it was before, and I haven't changed E6, S5 must be the same as what it was, what it was before in order to have the same flux. You can use that logic all the way up one step at a time. You can show that S4 can't be changed, S3 can't be changed. And the only thing that will be changed is S2. So that's why we have this, what looks like a strange situation where I perturb E3, yeah. and the only thing that appears to have been changed is S2 itself. This is the danger of using irreversible steps in your models. What's happening here is that there is a lack of communication across the network. So perturbations are blocked. Essentially what's happening is the perturbation at E3 is blocked from traveling upstream because the steps are irreversible. And because it's blocked from going upstream, upstream doesn't change and therefore downstream has to remain the same as well. Um, the minute you have communication up and down, right, because it's reversible, they start talking to each other and things start changing. And therefore you get this bottom left-hand one here where you see there's now been a net change in um, the concentrations. So you can get some strange artifacts in metabolic models if you just use irreversible kinetics, which is why Michael this morning showed you the reversible Michaelis-Menten law. Uh, you either use that one or you use a product inhibition variant. Um, otherwise, you'll get that lots of strange artifacts. Okay. In the past, these have been discovered accidentally. People do simulations and when they use irreversible kinetics and they find some very strange results and they realize. And this has been rediscovered a number of times uh, where if you yeah. use it, because a cell doesn't, a cell communicates right across the network. There's communication everywhere. Um, so, it's unrealistic to use reversible uh, reactions. Okay, so this is about communication, okay? Okay, so we'll come back to that then in a minute. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Oops. Robert, I have, uh, yeah. Uh, did you talk about boundary species yet? Uh, we have. X0 might not have been, okay. Yeah, we have. I can mention that again. Just just... Be aware here that X0 is fixed. If it wasn't fixed, X0 would just drain to, well, would just drain away. Yeah. And I wouldn't be able to sustain a steady state. Okay. So in all living systems, you need, if you want a, a rail pathway that mimics a living system, you must have fixed boundary. Okay. So as I'm sitting here, the oxygen level in the atmosphere is essentially fixed for me. So uh, that's an important thing to mimic in your models too. Okay, this just summarizes what I did. So the irreversible case, the flux is unchanged. And the only thing that happens is S2 goes down. That, that's because there's no communication along the pathway. For the reversible case, everything changes and even the pathway flux increases as well. Okay. 
All right, can we measure this somehow? All right, so can we quantify this? Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm going to focus only on the steady state, okay? We are gonna assume from now on that the pathway is at steady state. I'm not gonna look at transients, that's too complicated. And at steady state, we know that all the rates of change of S are zero, but there is a net flux, okay? All right, that's the steady state. Uh, let's do a um, let's do a uh, exercise, shall we? So we'll let, we could do this together if you like. Um, let's see. Uh, let me see if I got one here I can use. Um, where was I? Oh, was it? Yeah, reconnect. Right. Let's reconnect to that one and see what it does. Uh, get rid of that. Uh, Let's make sure this works by importing. One way, quick way to check it's still alive is to uh, import Tellurium and look, uh, it <laughs> died. <laughs> okay, so rerun that. Yeah, you have to keep it keep it alive. Um, yeah, I don't tend to use, for, for my actual research work, I don't use Colab. It's good for demoing and teaching because it's easy for people to get into it. Um, but for actual research, I don't recommend it. The other one, the other thing actually good for sort of a Jupyter Notebook like thing is it's you can do your research, then put it into a Jupyter Notebook and then ship it off to somebody because you can annotate it in that documentation and stuff. It's useful. Okay, so let's try now. Oh, got to do the uh, magic uh, <laughs> restart. Yes. And then import. Um, Takes a little while to load because it's a big thing to load and it's loaded. Okay. All right. So um, let's delete that. Delete, 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 delete. I don't want any of this. Okay. So we've got that. Okay. So let's create a new cell. All right. So there we are, ready to go. Okay. Um, one thing I want you to make sure you've got is the tutils. Okay. So I'm going to import that as well to make sure it's there. TU. I'll call it TU. Okay. Instead of TE. So. Tutils contains a bunch of plotting and model generation utilities that sort of have mm -hmm. grown up over time. Um, Michael, uh, this morning, he has a much more sophisticated um, model generation toolkit called SP Badger. Uh, I'm not going to use that because that's a fairly sophisticated tool. Um, but what I've got here is a really nice, uh, really simple way of generating just random networks. Okay. So if I go P1 equals TU build networks dot um, get linear chain, okay? And I'll get a linear chain, um, I guess we can do t 20 steps, okay? Yeah, I have. I now have a random network of 20 steps, okay? All right, uh, actually, I don't like that one. <laughs> Excuse me, I wanna <laughs> build another one. Uh, it doesn't have any enzymes. I want some enzymes, okay. Now, if I print that, ah, now I've got some. Now I've got some enzymes. Okay, the Vmaxes. Okay, so um, do the. I'll post this to the. I'll start posting things to the chat. Okay, so you have a record there. All right, so you can just copy. Paste. So that little, little thing here will generate a random linear chain. Okay, just in case it's got ten ten steps long. Okay, the it then asks compute the steady state. Okay, well let's um. Let's where did I go? Let's first do a time course, shall we? Just to see what it looks like. Oops, come on. Uh, let's do do that, and then oops, sorry. I have to load it into Roadrunner first. So now I can just load load a p one. Okay, so this is a case where p one it actually returns a string. This is a string. It's antimony format, I can just load it into load A, okay? And then I'll do a plot then straight after, okay? There you go. There it is. Uh, let's go for a bit longer, shall we? Let's go for 200. Let's do 1,000 points, make it look nice. Um, there you go. It's still going up. Okay, never mind. Um, let's see if we can compute the steady state, shall we? So to compute the steady state, you just ask for the steady state. And there it is. Now it returns a number. That number tells you how how confident it is in having found the steady state. And the smaller this is, the better. In fact, 10 to the minus 16 is fantastic. 
Uh, so it actually found the steady state, okay? So what's the uh, next one it says? Plot the concentrations. Now, I can just ask for the concentrations, get floating, get floating species concentrations, right? Uh, let me put the steady state in here. So you have that as well. And then I'll put this in as well. So you notice you have the word floating. That's to distinguish from the fixed species. Because if I look at the model up here, you'll notice that X0 is fixed and X1 is fixed. There's two boundaries on either side, okay? I, I don't care about those. I don't, I, I'm only interested in the floating one. So here's a floating one. These are just numbers, of, of course. Of a Roadrunner yeah. functions, they'll, they'll be called boundary species. So you can get the boundary oh, species yeah. concentrations. Or whatever Let's just do that for the hell of it. Yes, let's get the yeah. boundary species, boundary species concentrations. There's only two of them. Yeah. Uh, and the claims that one of them is set at seven and the other is set at zero. There you go, seven and zero. Okay, all right. Okay, well, how about a fancy way of plotting? Now you could mess around. I could, I guess, do, um, let's import matplotlib just for the hell of it. Matplotlib, matplotlib, pl, plot. You have to remember this thing. It's not, is that it? I think that's it. Yeah. Oh no, it's not. What is it? Matt. I plot. P Y P Y plot. I plot. Yeah. There you go. Okay. And actually, I could just do plot bar. Um. Now there's really one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's there's nine. So I need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then I can put the r dot get floating species concentrations and I get a bar. Okay, so that's, you can do it that way, but of course you have to remember how to do that. Let me just plot that into you as well. Um, the other way of doing it is just to use uh, T utils. It has uh, plotting. And then if you go there, it has plot. Um, where's the concentration? That's it, I think, isn't it? That's it. And you have no, that's that's in 3D. Sorry, that's the wrong one. Where is it? It was flat floating species. Just oh, there it is. Sorry. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. You just have to pass it the roadrunner instance. And then oops, and then it'll uh, plot it. The nice thing is it'll give you the labels as well. Okay. So anyway, there you can see that's the um it's a bit on the big side of the image, but uh, that's the concentrations. All right. What was the other thing? Oh, I said now, perturb the enzyme and recompute the steady state. Okay, let's do that then. So how do I uh, perturb the enzyme? So let's perturb um, E3. Now I know E3 is governed by VM3, which is 4.75. So VM3 is the Vmax, it's equivalent to the amount of enzyme. So I can actually just go VM3 equals VM3, oops. VM3, say times two. Okay. And then I can actually to recompute the steady state. Okay. And then I can ask it to let's redo the plot here. Um, and it looks exactly the same. Uh, is that is right? it also irreversible? No, they're all reversible, I think. Yeah, I mean, it could be that it's just not very sensitive. Uh, let me try, um, let's try V5, see what happens. Hmm, that looks the same as well. Oh, no, it's different, it's different, it's different, it's different. Uh, the y-axis is different. So it's, oh yeah, I see what's happening. Um, so when I perturb the, um, uh, the the v max everything downstream goes up and everything upstream comes down so you'll still get the sort of similar pattern but everything downstream will have gone up and so if you look at the x-axis here's 350 compared to 250 right now if you want to be clever you could actually do this uh, let me grab hold of this and 
that's with the perturbation. Okay. And then what I'll do then is I'll, oops, sorry. I'll then VM. Or a case are probably here. Yeah. yeah. VM5, what was VM5? Oh, I'll just divide it by two because I just, uh, so that's the, sort of the, I was the wild type. And then I'll plot, the, then I'll actually calculate the steady state. Oops. Calculate the steady state. Okay. And then I'll plot this again. Now, it would be better, um, and I think I, I can try a different color maybe. Uh, let's try running this, see what happens. Mm, what did I do wrong? Maybe you didn't like the that. Uh, yeah, I didn't like that. Okay. Now you can do cleverer things with this. For example, you could stagger the um, stagger their bars so they're next to each other instead of on top. These are on top of each other, and so. There is an opacity thing as well that you can use to make things transparent. Um, but you notice that uh, these two have gone up and presumably these ones, the blue has gone down. You can't see the blue because it's uh, underneath the orange, okay? But you can do some, if you look up uh, Google, you'll show you how you can sort of stagger these bar graphs so you get them side by side and then you can do a proper comparison, all right? Okay, uh, I think that was that was the exercise. Yes. So, what's the what's the take home message here? So, take home message here: if you do a perturbation somewhere in the middle of a pathway in a linear pathway, everything, all species downstream will go up, and all species upstream will come down. All right, and that's the way the perturbation works its way through the the network. Any questions on that? All right. I mean, one of the beauties of you know, working with Python is you can do lots of, um, you know, tricks like this. And once you know Python really well, you can work quite fast with it. Okay, oh, in fact, here it is. So here are the hints. So this building the model, loading the model, computing the steady state. Oh yeah, I've got, uh, I've got the two, I got the species at this steady state, SP1, and I'm plotting it. There's the plot I got there. This is the 20 steps, not um, not 10. Um, and then, Oh, actually, this is where I do do the stagger. Okay, this does the stagger. Uh, so I change the Vmax, multiply it by two, recompute the steady state, capture the new concentrations, and I just pull this off the internet, as we all do. Uh, this does two plots, bar plots. It uh, adds on a width, it changes the width of the second set of bars, uh, also adds a label. Uh, and then plots a legend and there's, there's a show. Let me see if I got it here. I don't have it here. So I guess I'm going to have to, uh, let me see if I can cut and paste it. Uh, okay, let's, let's try it, shall we? I should have got this ready beforehand, but anyway. Um, let's start from up here where the model was. Okay, so I'm going to delete everything from here. Get rid of it, okay. And then I'm going to, okay, so I don't need that. So that's that's collecting the first one. And then it says, uh, change the Vmax by doubling it. So let's do that. And then it says, compute the new steady state. And then capture the new concentrations in SP2. And then grab this chunk. This chunk does the, Stag plots the bar graph and staggers the. Uh, let's see what happens. Um, oh, all right. So I'm using NumPy here uh, in order to generate the list I need. This list designates where the bars are going to go. So before that, let's import NumPy. Okay. And then we run it. There you go. Okay. Then that's much better now. All right. So that. Yeah, that much gives you a much clearer picture. All right, so we did the perturbation at about, was it about one, two, three, four, five here in that division there. You notice that everything up, everything upstream, the orange has dropped, right? Concentration has dropped. Everything uh, downstream, all the orange has increased. Okay, so that's that basically shows that. Okay, so that's quite nice. 
All right. Um, so this is just a thought experiment. You know, if you make a perturbation, you can think of think your way through what's happening, and that's that's what this is. I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, what I really want to do is how can we quantify all these changes? All right. So, and this is basically the start of uh, metabolic control analysis proper. So metabolic control analysis defines this derivative, dj by de. Basically, in La in Eng in English, this is saying if I change E1, what happens to the steady state level in the flux? So J is the flux, okay? It's asking what happens to the steady state flux. The other thing it does is it does this scaling. It multiplies by E1 and divides by J. And this gives you an advantage now because everything turns into relative changes. And approximately what this measure is, is what is the percentage change in flux if I made a certain percentage change in E1. And I could do this to E2, E3, E4, and E5, all right? So I, if I did this for each of the steps, I would get a number, which tells me how much influence that particular step has on the pathway flux. Now, you're not just confined to, oops, I should, to fluxes, but I can also do concentrations. I can ask, well, if I make a change in E1, how does it affect S3? Or how does it affect S2? How does it affect S4? And I can do the same kind of ratio. If I made you know, uh, a certain percentage change in E1, what's the percentage change in S3? The nice thing about percentages right, is that um, you don't have to worry about units. So these are relatively easily measured, actually, experimentally, because you don't care about units. You're just worried about you know, what's the relative change. right? So if you do CRISPR, for example, those of you who know CRISPR, you know, CRISPR is often in, expressed in terms of a relative change it makes. So CRISPR can be used to um, upregulate or downregulate uh, expression levels. I mean, originally it was used to edit, edit DNA, but it's since been modified so you can use it to up and down regulate expression. You often express that in terms of fold change. So you say, yeah, this CRISPR construct increase the uh, expression rate one and a half times, right? So this is a natural a natural thing for experimentalists as a result. Okay. Now, one of the things you could do with MCA, it, I don't know if, you, if, you, if, you, if any of you have, you know, looked at Euclid's elements. So Euclid, you know, Euclid's elements is a book of geometry. And it's a very systematic way of approaching geometry, where you start off with some basic, very basic primitive ideas, and you build up a whole set of you know, results about geometry using logic. You can do the same thing with this. And I'm just going to show you one example, um, but I should let you know that MCA is full of these logical constructs. Uh, and they're used to um, pull out certain you know, new results about the system. So let me just show you this one, because this is probably one of the most famous ones. So I've got a two-step pathway here, E1, E2, two boundary conditions, X0, X1, all right? Let's say it's a steady state. Um, it has a single floating species in the middle. Uh, let's increase E1 by delta E1, right? I'm going to increase it by some small amount. And what will happen to the steady state? Well, S1 will go up and J will go up, okay? So if you did this simulation, you'd observe S1 going up and J going up. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to increase E2 slowly until the S1 is brought back to where it was before. And so we start off with an initial steady state. I perturb E1. I move E1 up. That will move S1 up. But now I'm going to change E2. So if I increase E2, that'll consume more S1, and I can bring S1 down to what it was before I did any perturbations. Okay, so this is the thought experiment we're doing. Given this thought experiment, I can write down certain, I can write this in terms of equations. I can write this in terms of the flux control coefficients. Um, because the S1 hasn't changed at all, the only thing that's changed is E1 and E2, and both of these contribute to the change in flux. So I can write down that the, I can write this relation here, which is the control coefficient times the percentage change in E1 plus the second control coefficient times the percentage change in E2 gives me the percentage change in flux. Remember that the control coefficients, you can think of them as just 
ratios of percentages. If I multiply both sides by E1%, I get CJE1, E1% equals J%. percent. That, that's all I've done here. And because there's more than one change, I can add them together. Right? Okay, so this is the, the first result. The second point to note is that most enzymatic rate laws, especially in metabolism, the reaction rate is directly proportional to the amount of enzyme. All right. Now, because of that, uh, I can make this statement. Because of this, and because S1 hasn't changed in my thought experiment, I can make this statement that the only contribution to the reaction rate was the change in E because nothing else happened. Because remember the thought experiment is that I make changes in E1 and E2 such that delta S1 equals zero. So this S here is zero. Uh, uh, this S here has not changed. And as, as a result, the only way that this rate could have changed, say across E1 is due to E1. And so the change in rate here must, the fractional change or the relative change in B must be the same as the relative change in E1. Given that result, I can now write this. So we have these two, and then we have this one. I can now substitute, instead of delta E1, E1, and delta E2, E2, I can swap in uh, delta V1, V1, and delta V2, V2. However, at steady state, all these rates are equal to the pathway flux. So in other words, they all cancel out, and I end up with this final result here. So this result um, is probably one of the most famous results in metabolic control analysis. It says that the, the sum of, in this case, two control coefficients equals one. Now, it turns out this is completely general. It doesn't matter whether the pathway is a linear chain, a branch, cyclic. It doesn't matter if you have feedbacks. It doesn't matter. This um, uh, result is always true. There's an opposite result to this, which which matches it, which is due to the condition, this condition here, which is that the sum of the concentration control coefficients is equal to zero. So they're basically complementary. You can't have one without the other, okay? So these are the two, uh, what are called the summation theorems. Now, you, I can hear you saying, yeah, that's very fantastic. Who cares? Uh, well, what does this suggest? Um, I'm going to switch over. This suggests, first of all, so I've turned this now into, into this. I've used this just this summation symbol here just to reduce the uh, notation. It basically suggests that control, i.e. influence, that enzymes have in a pathway is shared. Okay. Um, so every path, every enzyme has a little bit to say in how the flux is influenced. The other thing it says, which is really interesting, is if one step has more control, another step must have less. Now, these control coefficients are not static. They change according to the dynamics in the pathway. So if for some reason one control coefficient goes up, another control coefficient or multiple control coefficients have to decrease. There's a limited amount of control in the pathway that has to be distributed across the network. And if one gains, one or more must lose. Okay. So uh, that's, I guess that's one of, that's one important result. The other important result is since if I have, you know, N steps, a thousand steps in my pathway, the average influence a particular step has will be one over N, the average. Right, so that suggests that most steps have little influence, probably doesn't prove it at all, but it might suggest that, I mean, you can think of two scenarios. Either every step has very little influence, which means your gene regulatory network has no a way to control the network at all because it can up and down regulate enzymes and nothing happens. Or, you can imagine that most steps are small, but a few have higher control. And in fact, it's the latter that from experiments that have been done, measurements that have been made, also some theoretical con uh, considerations. It seems that um, most control is focused on a small number of steps. If it wasn't the case, 
it would be impossible for the gene regulatory network to have any way to control metabolism. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's see if this is true, shall we? Let's let's see that my suggestion is that um, there will be focus control rather than um, small control everywhere. Okay. So let's um, let's do this experiment. So I'm going to uh, let's grab this. I'm going to grab this. Okay. I'll post this to the uh, to the stats uh, to the chat. So I'm going to build a new network. So let's get let's, let's start it down here, shall we? So okay, so there I go. I've got I've got my network. Um, this time I'm just going to build a simple uh, mass action network because the result comes out clearer if you do that. I'm then going to compute the steady state. We know how to do that. Okay, compute the steady state. Nice, ten to the minus fifteen. That's a good one. And then let's compute the so there's a thing in TUtils. I mean, Roadrunner has its own stuff, but the TUtils one has a nice um, uh, heat map function. So what this will do is it'll compute all the control coefficients for every step, and then it'll convert into a heat map, okay? So let's see what happens. And it's running, there we go. Okay, good, right, now. Uh, let me zoom out a bit. There you go. Okay. Now you'll notice that um, the rows are are labeled J1 to J10. Um, it's computing the control coefficients with respect to every step, every step in the pathway. So there are ten steps. Therefore, it thinks there are ten fluxes. All right. So there are ten fluxes, which is why it's got J0, J1 to J10. Um, but we only really have to worry about one row because in a linear pathway, every step carries the same flux. So let's just focus on one row. And what do you see down here in the columns? The columns are marked E0 to E9. These are the enzymes on each step. So you've got 10 enzymes. Um, and the first thing you see, right, this is a random network. Notice that, first of all, notice that along a row, these have to add up to one. So 0.63 plus 0.17 plus 0.06, all that has, a, has to add up to one. And notice immediately that the first two have most of the control. I can run this again. Let's try it again, shall we? See what we get. Different random network. Same again. Most of the control is focused at the front. This is a turns out to be a general result for a linear pathway. Uh, you'll find that most of the control, like 50, 60% of it, is, is uh, on the first step. It then drops off very rapidly. In fact, these steps at the end, the last five, have no influence whatsoever, pretty much. Now, if you're a metabolic engineer and you wanted to re-engineer this pathway, do not bother with the last seven. Uh, it won't get you very far. You need to focus your metabolic engineering on the first three. If you're looking for a drug target that can influence the metabolic flux, don't bother with the bottom seven. The only way to influence the bottom seven is to have a huge drug um, uh, level. Right, you'll have to you'll have to put in so much drug that you'll probably kill the patient from the side effects. So don't bother. The way to target this this pathway, if you're a if you're a pharmaceutical company, is to target the first two. Just to show you once more, let's try it again. Uh, once more. Okay, this is slightly different. 0 0.43, 0 0.43 on the first two, but you notice it's all focused on the top on the top two. Okay, um, any questions on that? You good? Okay. Um, okay, so that was a little exercise we did. Well, I did, really. Um, you might be thinking, that's great. Has anybody done any any rail stuff? Has anybody actually measured these? Uh, yes, they have. This is an old one because uh, I happen to like it, but there's a lot been done since. Uh, so this is in uh, potato. Right, um, tuber tissue potato looking at glycolysis. 
and they uh, estimated the control coefficients for every step in glycolysis. And you can see that most of the control is on this one, 0.702. 70% of the control is on pyruvate kinase. Notice they all add up to approximately one, which is nice. Some of them have no control at all, like aldolase, triphosphate isomerase, and, and this one here, this these pair. Um, PGI, phosphoglycerate isomerase, has a little bit about 0.14. PFK, which is the classic rate limiting step that you find in the textbooks, has hardly anything. It's only got like 10% of the control. So PFK is not rate limiting. If you're going to talk about rate limitingness at all, uh, you would perhaps claim that pyruvate kinase is, is the most rate limiting step in this particular organism. Every organism will be different, right? Not all these numbers vary from organism to organism, depending on what they are. But the general pattern is often the same, though. PFK often has a very low control coefficient, even though it's the most regulated step in the pathway. Okay, so you can go to literature; you'll find lots of these measured uh, or computer. Okay, so here's some principles. Then, first of all, there's no such thing as a rate limiting step. There's only degrees of limitingness which can be quantified. You can think of these numbers, these influence numbers, as how limiting the step is, right? So aldolase and TPI not limiting at all, whereas PK is most is the most limiting step. Um, the other principle, principle four, is whether an enzyme limits flux or not is a, is a systemic property, meaning it's the property of the entire network. I cannot pull pyruvate kinase out of this potato, study it in a test tube and tell you that its control coefficient will be 0 0.702. That's not possible. That 0 0.702 comes from pyruvate kinase being embedded in the entire network and communicating in the way I showed at the beginning, you know, through, through propagations of disturbances uh, up and down the network. So that's the other principle. So if you want to know whether a step is limiting or not, you have to look at it in the intact pathway. Okay. Um, now, how can I relate these numbers to the individual? I mean, how can I how can I answer the question? Why is this one point seven two, and why is this one near zero? Now, how can I answer that question? Well, the way to the answer that question, we have to have a look at how how perturbations move up and down the pathway because it's those movements that determine these values, right? So the fact that this is zero means that any disturbance here finds it very difficult to propagate out, whereas a disturbance here finds it relatively easy to propagate out and thus have an influence. And the propagations are measured by um, things called uh, elasticities. They are also these sort of uh, scale derivatives. They basically tell you, uh, in fact, I got a better one here. This is a better one. So this is a michaelis menten equation. So you've got a substrate on the x-axis and the reaction rate on the y-axis. This is the plot, normal michaelis menten plot. The elasticity tells me basically the slope at any particular point on the curve. It's a scaled slope. It's not, it's again, unitless. But you can imagine the elasticity up here, because the slope is very shallow, is close to zero. The elasticity down here, where the slope is sort of linear, the elasticity is one. And in the middle, it sort of varies then between one and zero, and it's roughly a half. And um, let me see if I, and then if you take the product, so this is the substrate, right? The substrate. If you take the product of the reverse from Michaelis Menten, of course, now when I add product, the reaction rate drops because I'm slowing down the reaction rate. In this case, the slope is negative, and so your elasticities are negative, right? So products slow down rates, substrates make rates go faster. Uh, it's in the opposite direction. This time, when the product is at high, the, the product, uh, these should be VP. The product elasticity should be close to zero. And when it's when at low product level, the product elasticity will be minus one and then minus 0.5 in between. Okay. Now it's these things that um, propagate disturbances up and down the pathway. Okay. 
Uh, this just summarizes the substrate elasticity is the positive, product elasticity is negative. Now, I'm not going to go into this in any detail much, but it turns out there's a relationship between the elasticities, these unit responses that relate to individual steps, and the control coefficients which relate to the entire pathway. And this is called the connectivity theorem. Um, it basically says for two adjacent steps, there's an inverse relationship between the elasticities and the control coefficients. All right, so um, that's basically what it's saying. Now, if I combine, if I combine the summation property with the connectivity theorem, I can actually solve for the control coefficients just in terms of the elasticities. Once you have it in this form you can now start to understand why some influences on the control coefficients are bigger than others, all right? This is what I said starting from, when I started at the beginning, being able to understand why, why pathways behave the way they do. Uh, these relationships basically help you to do that because you can look at where these values and then, then determine what makes some control coefficients high, what makes some of them low, okay? Um, all right, so why is it that in my simulations that I showed here, this one here, why is it then that the front steps have higher control than the bottom steps? It turns out, um, if you look at the, this is just a three-step one, if you derive the equations for the control coefficients for these steps and you look at the numerator, the numerators actually indicate the path that a perturbation takes. So if you look at this one, E21, E3, E32. So E2, E21 is how S1 affects V2. E32 is how S2 affects V3. So if I make a perturbation in V1, the perturbation jumps from S1 to S2 via these forward elasticities. If I look at the last step, you'll notice now I've got E11 and E22. These are actually the product elasticities. So pro propagations that move downstream are determined by all the forward substrate elasticities. Propagations that move upstream are all determined by the product elasticities. Now, I'm not going to say why this is the case, but it's a, there's a thermodynamic, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I could I could say it's a thermodynamic gradient, but it's even easier than that. Uh, it turns out that the uh, changing forward rates is much easier than changing the backward rates. So the elasticities for the substrates will for the reactants will always be bigger than the elasticity for the products. Right? Uh, you, uh, I mean, I can just it, there's a thermodynamic argument. It's basically easier to go down the to move mass down the down the thermodynamic gradient than up the thermodynamic gradient, all right? And so it turns out the the s the substrate elasticities will always be bigger. Since these are always bigger than these, i this one these ones are always bigger than these ones. On average, this control coefficient will always be bigger than this control coefficient. Hence we get this pattern pretty much always. Let's generate another one just for the hell of it. All right. There it is again. That, and that, pattern, that pattern happens because it's easier for a perturbation upstream to move downstream. And because it, it can do that, it actually has a net effect. On the other hand, if I were to change a, a E9, that propagation finds it very hard to move upstream. And because of that, it has hardly any effect at all. And, that, and that's the reason why you see this pattern, okay? All right. Um, okay, and that's that's basically what you get here. All right, so you could plot those as a histogram, and you'll see a, uh, this, this drop here, okay? All right. Uh, so here's uh, another principle then. So in an unregulated pathway, meaning no negative feedback loops with only mass action and Michaelis momentum kinetics, the sensitivity, i.e. the flux control coefficient or the flux to enzyme changes 
is biased towards the front of the pathway. The front of the pathway will always, on average, have more influence than the back of the pathway. Okay, all right. However, and this is basically the finale, what happens if I put a negative feedback loop in? So what happens when we include a negative feedback loop? Um, I can recompute those equations again. Uh, and basically what happens is you end up with an extra term in the denominator, uh, which is the represents the feedback elasticity, the influence of the elasticity. Um, but you notice the numerator now doesn't have one product term, it has two product terms. And those two product terms represent the two ways in which disturbances can travel through the pathway. I think, yeah. So if I make a disturbance in E3, that disturbance will either go up the main spine, right, through the green lines, green arrows, or it can go up through the negative feedback loop, right? So there's two ways for the disturbance to travel up. Um, so that's basically what the numerator tells us, okay? Um, I'm not going to, at, at this point, I'm not, uh, I guess I could tell you this. Um, so the epsilon two, uh, one, two, uh, two, one, this one here, that's two on one. That's the feedback elasticity. If I were to make that bigger and bigger and bigger, make this bigger and bigger and bigger, so this dominates the denominator, right? Um, these two become negligible. And if essentially this, this one becomes this one here, then also this term here is the same as this term. So basically the ratio of these two dominates the expression. So in fact, the control coefficients tends to one. For the concentration control coefficient, because the elasticity for the feedback doesn't appear, let me see, where is it here? Um, because the elasticity for the feedback doesn't appear in the numerator, as I increase the strength of the feedback, the dominant the denominator gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger relative to the numerator, and this tends to zero. Okay, so what does that mean? So with feedback, control on the third step tends to one, and the control over the signal molecule tends to zero. This is in fact the exact opposite to what happens in a non-regulated step. So let me show you. Yeah, okay, I can show you it. So the feedback has these consequences. All flux control moves downstream. Remember in the simulation, we had all flux control was upstream. With feedback, all control moves downstream. In fact, the regulated step has very little flux control. That's why phosphofructokinase in glycolysis, which is highly regulated, has a very small control coefficient. Uh, and the signal molecule S3 shows very, very strong homeostasis. It's basically locked in place due to the negative feedback. All right. Uh, you see this a lot in metabolism, in glycolysis, amino acid biosynthesis. Basically, it's a means of matching uh, supply and demand. So basically, the demand has all the control over the supply, which is exactly what, what you'd want. Um, to have. So in glycolysis, demand is basically ATP production. And so you really want ATP production to control glycolysis, not the other way around. Right? So glycol glycolysis is there to be told what to do by ATP demand. And you can make that happen by putting a negative feedback around, around glycolysis. Okay. So just to show you the effect, I there's a I did a simulation. I don't have the code here, but uh, I did a simulation. So first of all, I I generated this uh, four-step pathway. I generated 5,000 random pathways, four-step pathways, okay? I basically randomized the rate constants, but I kept the equilibrium constants fixed. I then computed the control coefficients in each of the 5,000 pathways. I then plotted the frequency of the control coefficient values for each step. And that's what you see here. So you can see that, um, so if you look at the x-axis, the high on the x-axis means more control, okay? Whereas the low means uh, very little control. So you can see that step one in red 
has most of the control. Step four, which is the very last one, has the least control, right? Round about 0 0.0, whatever, 0 0.01. So this is the example I just showed you where the first few steps have all the control and all the downstream ones are done. The minute I put in a negative feedback, you get this complete difference. Basically what's happening is control gets squeezed out between the between the first and bottom step, between the first step and the and the end step. So hardly any control in the middle, but the most of the control is on the, the last step. And some, like point one, is on the first step. So this is very typical. Um, and this is basically what negative feedback does. It basically pushes all the influence to either ends, but with most of the influence going to the bottom step. Um, and I think, and just to give you a real, this is now a real example that was published. Um, this is serine metabolism uh, in bacteria and humans. What's interesting is the regulation is very different in both these pathways uh, for some reason, but in bacteria, serine has a negative feedback loop going all the way back to the front. Whereas in humans, the negative feedback is very stunted. It's actually right on the step itself. If you measure the control coefficients in these uh, in these pathways, uh, actually just in the um, human one, you notice that all the control now is at the last step. Now it does vary depending on conditions. So if you're fasted, this is what the control looks like uh, in your serine pathway. If you're not fasted, control sort of distributes evenly between the, the, the steps. So you can see that, that um, control is quite dynamic. It moves about. It's not a fixed thing. It moves about depending on conditions. Uh, but here's an exact actual example where somebody investigated how control was redistributed according to the, uh, you know, whether you're fasted or not fasted. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, principle seven then. Um, steps regulated by feedback control are insensitive to changes in their, en in their enzyme activity. And... Classical rate limiting steps such as phosphatokinase, ink glycolysis are not, in this sense of the word, rate limiting, which basically goes against all the textbooks. People have measured measured the rate limitingness in phosphatokinase on many organisms, and in every case, they found that uh, PFK has very little control and is not rate limiting. Okay, uh, let me see. Um, yeah, metabolic feedback or the rarer feed forward ensures homeostasis of metabolites to the control of supply and demand. Okay. And I think that's it. This is a pretty big topic. There's a bunch of textbooks. Uh, David Fell had one of the original textbooks. He's actually released this to the public domain and it's now actually on archive.org. Uh, Brian Ingalls has a nice book, it's more theoretical. Uh, he also, um, before it was published, he actually published the PDF of it that's available to him. And I have my one as well. Uh, it's, it's about $7, I think, as a PDF on Gumroad. Uh, but once I, when if I get around to doing a second edition, I'll push the first edition out as a as a freebie. Uh, but there are, and Wikipedia actually has a whole lot of pages on it as well that you can look at. And I think that's yeah, that's it. Okay, so it's a big it's a big area. Um, I've only scratched the bare surface. I and mean, if if there's anything you can take out of it, is this is this idea that you can have measures of influence, how different steps influence, you know, fluxes or metabolite levels. You know, you can either look at how fluxes change or how concentrations change. And that gives you an initial quantitative picture of a pathway. You won't get this kind of thing from a simulation, although we can use simulations to get at these numbers. Uh, but this, these numbers give you extra insight into what's going on. And in particular, it helps you answer these big questions, especially on the application side, you know, which enzyme should I re-engineer? And, uh, you know, which enzyme should I target? So there's a very nice study actually uh, on the drug targeting side in trypanosome. 
So trypanosome is a protozoan that causes sleeping sickness. Um, and there aren't many good drugs for it. And there was a whole, there was a series of studies on whether they could target the energy metabolism in trip, trypanosome. And they did a lot of computer simulations. And the conclusion was that uh, energy metabolism in trypanosome is pretty much locked down. And there was only one target they found, which was the pyruvate transporter in the parasite membrane. Um, I'm not sure what's happened to that since, but I know they started looking at that. So if you tried to target any of the enzymes in, you know, in the glycolysis in trypanosome, it wouldn't have any effect because of this. And it turned out there was only, there may have been two sites was pyruvate transport and glucose transport were two potential sites for new drug targets. Okay, that's it. I have, that's all I have to say, I think. Um, this is a big area, but I thought it may give you a flavor uh, of what it's like. Um, I liked it because it answered my my question as a graduate student. How do these things work? Uh, you know, if you're if you're an engineer, it's the kind of thing you ask, right? Um, I guess every kid asks, how does a clock work? How does a radio work? It's the, it's pretty much fundamental to the way humans operate. Um, for me, you know, simulation didn't really help. It just gave me more questions and answers. And ultimately I ended up doing, you know, looking at MCA, which helped a lot. Okay, I think that's it. Um, if we have no questions, we can, uh, can we can hand it back to um, Veronica, I guess. Um, what we, I think, is that right, Veronica? Yeah, I mean, it would still be a question period, but if people wanted to, ask any questions about the content that's been discussed, we can try to answer those, but also if you have questions about your own research, we might be able to advise yeah. on that as well. Or any questions about the software, mm -hmm. um, we can uh, talk about that as well. Or anything, for example, in the software that you'd like that we don't have. Mm -hmm. Can we go ahead and stop recording for the yeah. control analysis thing here? Yeah.